Thank you, Professor Antes, and thanks to uh, our friends Manos and Manos for the kind invitation. So this is an, a really an intriguing topic for me and for Manos as well, I think. Okay, how to go, page down. Okay, that's the agenda of our presentation. We speak about the risk factors for recurrent an anterior shoulder instability after banca repair, the glenoid bone loss, the humeral bone loss, the remplissage about the technique, the results and complication, and finally our conclusion. What are the risk factors? We know since several years, this, pub this paper was published 10 years ago. They are the age, the younger you are, the worst is. The number of dislocation, the early return to sports, the type of sports, hyperlaxity, and glenoid and humeral bone loss. Regarding the glenoid bone loss, we are, all of us, we are uh, aware of that. You know, Steve Burkhardt teaches us that the glenoid bone loss is a huge a bad prognostic factor, and we have an overloading of the bone tissue repair interface with a failure at the end of the day. That's why it's very important to do a CT scan to evaluate our patient. And we have this inverted PR if we have more than 25% of glenoid bone loss. But more recently, as Giuseppe already told us, you know, uh, we have a, this critical bone loss that is reducing and reducing. So we know that if we have glenoid bone loss over 20%, not 25 as Steve was telling us, then we have a significant increased failure rates and we have clinical unacceptable results if we have a glenoid bone loss more than 13.5%. And even another more recent paper, a biomechanical one, shows that 15% for sure is the threshold we should not overpass. So Latarge should be performed in patient with more than 15 to 20% of bone loss. And then we know about the humeral side bone loss. So that's important to have this concept of bipolar and AG Toy, Giovanni Di Giacomo and Steve Burkert as well, they teach us about that. And we have to understand that almost all the patients that they have a dislocation, they have an ill sax somehow. I mean, 93% is close to 100. And so in bipolar bone loss, bunker is not enough. And that's why Remplissage came out with uh, uh, Eugene Wolf to feel the defect in the humeral head. The indication are off track heel sax lesion, engaging at the time of arthroscopy, glenoid bone loss that should stay inferior to 13.5 and 50%. Anterior, and then you can even treat patient with anterior, both in combined and posterior instability. Contraindication is severe glenoid bone loss, preoperative stiffness, infraspinatus compromise, and overhead athlete. But this is relative, really, at least in my experience. Then a couple of cases just to show you what, what is, why is so important remplissage. This is a guy, 44 years old. He was treated in 2009 with arthroscopic stabilization left shoulder after traumatic first time dislocation in February 2021, so 12 years after. I, I didn't do the first procedure, it was another guy. He had a traumatic dislocation, but a debilitating shoulder. He had uh, an active range of motion limited for pain, full range of motion. O'Brien test was positive and apprehension and relocation test positive. That's the CT scan. And you can see the previous surgery, probably had the bony bank or treat them somehow. Then you can see the humeral head defect. That's another view of the three anchors that were put in. And of course I left them. That's the MRI with the intact calf that was perfect. That's the vision inside the joint. So you have a bank art tear, at least important with the capsule together. Then the slap tear. So we reduce the slab, we fix always first the slab to have a reduction of the anterior labellum, and then we fix the banca repair. And then we go in the posterior side and you can see that we have a huge heel sacs and we use one metal anchor in titanium with this parachute technique. Remplissage should not be an aggressive technique, at least in my mind. And that's one case, a standard case, a revision case anyway. This is another guy, 25 years old, 2019, traumatic first time dislocation, and then some episode of subluxation. 
but full range of motion, calf and biceps test negative, apprehension relocation test positive, load and shift, both anterior and posterior. So anterior instability and posterior instability in this guy. That's the MRI artogram showing the slap, a slap lesion and both the anterior and posterior labrum tear. So we start with the slap repair. And then you take advantage even of the Neweiser portal. That's very important. This is a course I'd like to, to show this small trick. It's very useful to treat slap lesion. Of course, all of you, you know this trick. Then you shuttle in and you repair the slap first. Okay. And then we go in the anterior labrum that was in an Alpsa kind of tear. So everything was attached in, in a bad position. So you need to do a very huge detachment of the labrum of the capsule in the anterior side. Then you rebuild the capsule. You suture back the bank cart in a very good position with a very nice bump. And then you go in the back part. In, in the bed, back part. So you see that uh, we have a huge sax lesion. Then you switch from posterior. And this is not a problem to do the remplissage after the anterior part. Eh? This is a false kind of uh, problem. You go in the posterior part. You use the pump. And you can have the possibility to well work. Of course, you have to take advantage of the rotation of the arm. Don't stay with the fixed arm. Just move. And finally, you will find enough room to work posteriorly. Then you put the anchor for the remplissage. You pass the, the suture in the parachute technique as well. And then we have to fix the, the posterior bankard. This is not possible to, to be done with the lateral shape procedure. Eh? So you start repairing the posterior labrum with one anchor, was not a, a huge uh, posterior bankart, a couple of stitches with a capsule together with the labrum, and then you close the posterior labrum. A and as a final step, you close the, the remplissage. That's the trick here. But the most important technical pair is that take advantage of the pump. Go with the pump very high when you, when you work posteriorly. This is not a problem. This will open a world for you, OK? And then TCP anchors on the glenoid, don't use metal, but you need to use metal on the humeral head because the humeral head bone is very weak. And if you use biobsorbable peak, you can have very nasty, nasty surprises. Then another technical port, uh, point is this one. Since this is a capsulomyodesis, this is not a tenodesis remplissage, it's a capsulomyodesis. If you stay too medial, then you will have a stiff shoulder, a huge loss of external rotation. So you have to calculate the entire is sucks in lateral to medial. And then you should stay at 50%. Don't go too medial, OK? Stay at the right point. Otherwise, you can have complication. And what about the results of remplissage? In the literature, we take advantage of the systematic reviews. We have this first one in 2019. Remplissage 5.8% of recurrence rate compared to banker that goes from 20 to 25.7. No difference in the results in between remplissage and latarge, but 0.4% of complication with this technique. And another more interesting in 2020 systematic review, Bankart versus Bankart plus, plus remplissage. Raw score better for remplissage, remplissage recurrence rate 3.2%, isolated bankard 17%, uh, higher revision rate with simple bankard, and when compared latarge with bankard pure remplissage, no statistically significant clinical difference, no statistically significant difference in recurrence rate in between the two techniques, significantly higher complication with latarge technique. But Remplissage is not working every time. And this paper in 2021, it tell us that we need to stay in subcritical bone loss. So if we go with the remplissage on a big damage on the bone, to treat a big damage on the bone, then we will pay the bill because we have no complication or very low complication. But if we stay more than 15% of glenoid bone loss, then we have huge complication even using a remplissage. 
And what about the complication? Because we need to clarify this point, because we have some complication here. And this is a course, we need to be aware of that. Remplissage related complication, transient neuropraxia, adhesive capsulitis, and deep wood infection. Fortunately, I didn't have it, but the, if they exist, they will come if you operate a lot. I had the loss of external rotation, yes. Infraspinatus strangulation. This is very, very, very funny, I will show you. And finally, what about the fatty degeneration that make us, you know, afraid of doing a remplissage? This is the first complication, that is the strangulation. As you can see here, this, is, this happen if you stay with the anchor to medial and then with the suture passage through medial. Then you have a strangulation with the suture of the infraspinatus tendon and the patient was very symptomatic. So you always have to listen to the patient. The patient was coming to me complaining, uh, stiff shoulder. And, you know, I told to this poor guy, we need to wait one year because in orthopedics you need one year to have the final results. At one year, this guy came back and I, this shoulder is really terrible. On the other side, you, t you, you did me a bunker, it's very good, and now I'm suffering. I reoperated on this guy and this was the result. You remove and you clean everything and you close the cuff. The other complication that I was afraid was the fatty degeneration of the infraspinatus. So we decided to do a clinical study with MRI to look 14 patients that we treated uh, with remplissage, with very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria to have a sound scientific study. And to make it short, all patients had very good clinical results. Statistically, they had a reduction of external rotation, but 100% of them, they went back to the sports. I was not so good as other surgeons. I had two recurrence, 14% uh, of recurrence rate, even with the remplissage. Maybe it's my limit. One was treated, was treated with the lateral shade, the other had a conservative treatment. And what about the MRI? The MRI, in 50% of the cases, no kind of fat infiltration. In the other 50%, Fuchs grade one, uh, one uh, uh, fat infiltration. The MRI was taken three years after the remplissage, and not six months after, to, to detect all the people. And in the remplissage, we had a layer of fibrous tissue that was occupying the, uh, the heel sacs lesion. And uh, in the two cases where we had a recurrence, this was because we had a huge ILSAX lesion, uh, almost double of the mean of all these case areas. So uh, around uh, 2,049 millimeters, square millimeters, minimal filling of ILSAX, and we have adipose tissue instead of fibrous tissue. But the infraspinatus fortunately was not damaged. So take home message of my lecture. Latarge and bunker repair with remplissage are effective treatments option in bipolar bone loss and subcritical glenoid bone loss. Remplissage is a safe procedure with lower recur recurrence rate than isolated bunker repair and with significantly lower complication rate than Latarge procedure. Loss of external rotation is a small concern and unlikely to be clinically significant. Avoid over medialization, that's a secret of Latarge. So in conclusion, remplissage is my preferred stabilization procedure in glenoid bone loss less than 15% and significant off-track ISAX lesion. I take the chance to invite all of you to the ESCA meeting that will be in two years in May in Milano, in my hometown. And I thank you very much for your attention.